1994, Kings of New York. By 1993, whispers had reached the West. The Ennead rumored to restore triumph to the East had arrived. Fearing the title they'd held since 91 was in jeopardy, Firing Squad unleashed its most dangerous MC to protect their neck. K9's disc, one that would eventually generate $45 million in retail sales, was the most sought after in rap music history. Periscope had been rescued from the brink of bankruptcy by two acts, their gamble with the boy and their investment in Firing Squad records. THC cost a quarter million to make and had earned them an estimated $50 million in less than two years. And each day that passed meant a chance at a new case, more fame, and increased sound scans for the boy. That year on Samhain, the soldier took revenge on a couple of spooks in Atlanta and basically turned water to wine for the last of the infidels who never thought that hip hoppers would take it that far the ones who refused to believe that we were turning our father's dreams into markets and a living, breathing economy. What quickly became paramount, though, was the inspiration that this hip-hop generation had provided. The burden bearers, in only 15 years, their peers had emerged as multimillionaires. Suddenly we had nice clothes, nice watches, nice women and rings, but some couldn't relate to those who didn't have nice things. So while the nations celebrate, we kicked back and we wait, knowing this year was inevitable. This summer, unforgettable. The streets tweaked for weeks with niggas too geeked to sleep, arguing over who was the best MC Thomas A.D. of Malik. QB excerpt 48. Fatima turned her stereo down to answer the knock at her bedroom door. The apartment was quiet these days. She and Sirius had decided years ago that in order for their love to last, they should go their separate ways. Bagheera was grinding. He popped in maybe twice a week to drop off money and change clothes in ink. It seemed had just made it home. He stuck his head in the door. Hey, Ma, you got a sec? Fatima took off her glasses and marked her page in Deepak Chopra's Ageless. His body timeless mind with them. Sure, I think I can spare a few of those. Malik, the adult version, entered the room dressed in jeans and a tee, Tim's and a Nike jacket. His wavy hair and chipped tooth were gleaming when he bent over and hugged his mother. The man momentarily giving way to a youthful demeanor that reminded her of the days when he couldn't hold himself and pee right. Where's Pop at? Fatima reminded him that Sirius was out of town. She could tell he was in one of his moods and offered her ear instead. What's up? Nothing. Can't a guy just converse with his old earth? You don't conversate for sport, Malik. If you're talking, you've got something to say. Out with it? How's my grandchild? Is she okay? After years of trying, karma had finally come to Malik after Chico caught a sentence in 90. For better or worse, they were a couple now, and they're on and off again. Relationship had produced a beautiful baby girl. She's fine. And her mother? Fine. They're fine. Malik sat in the chair next to Fatima's bed. What's wrong with me, Ma? He sounded stressed. Why can't I just be normal like everybody else? I see black people outside, living, loving, and enjoying they lives, and I be thinking, why can't that be me? I want to hang out and talk to people, but Fatima comforted him. There's nothing wrong with you, Malik. You can't help being introverted. It's part of what makes you you. Since 89, Malik had virtually banished himself to his room in search of the miraculous. He'd taken a leave from his studies with the NOI and become a spiritual nomad. His expeditions taking him out into the wilderness and back to the cradle of life where he was astonished to learn how, for a period in history, his ancestors were the wealthiest in the world. 
their continent home to the most advanced civilizations where students of all races and faiths traverse desert sands to learn from imams at the most distant universities in the world, the Jene and Sankor mosques. And then there was Egypt, of course, the link to Arabia, the Holy Land, and home to mysteries buried so deep that to this day, masons, archeologists, and Egyptologists are busy excavating antiquities in the Valley of Kings. Even more surprising was how school had taught him that Greek society was the beginning of modern culture, but his teachers had failed to inform him where Alexander and the other greats had stolen much of their knowledge from. Now that he'd recovered some of it, he'd come home eager to share. But if you wanna be social, asked Fatima, what's stopping you? No one's interested in what I got to say. All people talk about around here is crimes and jail. I ain't with that. To me, they waste time with empty arguments. They never have real conversation. I want people to learn something from my lyrics, but that ain't what's selling right now. She took his hand. My son, the Bodhisattva, what's that? Buddhism, the Bodhisattvas are enlightened beings. They're in line to be future Buddhas and can pass into Nirvana whenever they wish, but they put it off so that they can help others on the path. I can understand why you're lonely. That kind of compassion springs from a deeper well than most of us have. When the average person finds a little slice of happiness, they run with it, Malik scoffed. Really, asked Fatima, can you blame them? What would you do if heaven was a mile away? Malik point to himself. I ain't satisfied with just a slice of happiness. Success to me is the whole pie. I want my people to eat too. Success and failure are what each person determines them to be. Well, asked Malik, what about people that say that say, no idea is original and everything that's worth saying has already been said? Sometimes, he confessed, I feel like a failure for saying things that have been said in the past. I believe that if anyone has the ability to teach something, then they should do it. If only one person learns from them, how could there ever be failure in that? Maybe your job is to put information into a form that your peers can understand. It seems like it's a thankless job, he said, and more than I signed on for. If you don't do it, who will? The ability to tell a story is a gift, and like the saying goes, to whom much is given, much is required. Fatima let him consider that for a moment before asking, so what was it that you wanted to talk about anyway? Africa. Africa. What brought that on? Me and Ice was hanging out at his crib watching cable. How is he? He hasn't been around here in a while. He's good. We've been busy running around trying to get this music done. He wanted to come through the other day and get some chupitulas. She smiled. Tell him he's welcome anytime. So you were saying? We was watching all the stuff going on in Somalia and Rwanda. The media make our people look incompetent, like they can't govern themselves. And why are the countries so poor? Why do they depend on these other people for their survival? Something ain't right. I've read books on it, and sometimes I wonder who the authors are. They're usually the victorious. Finding good information can take some research. Get on the net. It's great. At school, I'm on it whenever I get a chance. Anyway, there's a tribe from East Africa called Zulus. Africa Bambata, Malik said under his breath. Who? The guy who made Planet Rock. He founded a group called the Zulu Nation. Oh, I remember that song. Well, the name Zulu means people from the stars. They have a Sansui named Credo Mutua. He's their official keeper of knowledge and a master storyteller. If you want a really interesting viewpoint on what happened in Africa, you should look him up. I have said Malik proudly. So which one you believe in, Darwinism or creationism? Whew, Fatima exclaimed. That's a long one. Why don't we save it for next time? He agreed. And Malik, she said, don't waste time worrying about what fools say. They'll always make jokes of what they don't understand. Thanks, Ma. What for? Just for being there, for listening. We should do this more often. You're closer than Pop, and I think you might give better answers. Fatima tapped her book. I'd like that. You know your father is a good man, Malik. Smart, too. But his music is his first love, and for him to create, he needs... How can I put this? He needs his space. 
You two are more alike than you know, both sensitive people in harsh surroundings. For a long time, your father had a hard time dealing with his feelings, but as he progressed as a musician, he learned to channel them into his work. She snapped her fingers. There's a case of evolution at work for you. You learned to do that much earlier in life. You're by far a more perceptive critic than he was at your age. Malik thanked her again. I'll tell you something else you may not know. I always regretted getting you the typewriter instead of that camcorder. Ma, don't worry about... She raised her hand. But I was sitting in the courtyard with Sheila the other day, and the boys were around back playing ball, and the radio from one of their cars was blasting like always. And to my surprise, whose voice do I hear but yours? I've been living here for a long time, and I've sat on that bench more times than I can remember, but I've never had the view I did that day, not until you painted the picture for me. Fatima had a great big smile as she wiped the corners of her eyes. I had to leave Sheila and come upstairs. Malik touched her on the shoulder. I came up here to your room and pulled up a chair and I opened your window and I just sat there and listened and watched as my son crafted images with his words. I thought about you and Baggy, Bill and Merlin, and my kids at school. And I thought to myself, what a group you all are. Creators, this generation's improvisers and innovators. You all are special whether you know it or not. And that's when it occurred to me the meaning of the clot. In the name of thy Lord who createth, createth man from a clot, and thy Lord is most bounteous, who teacheth by the pen, teacheth man that which he knew not. Malik was humbled and lay prostrate on the floor, overcome by her words like never before. Special, said Fatima, as she lift his head high. This is your time, young prophet, you joyous human being, the creation of the believers with the blood of a slave and the heart of a king. They hugged for a long time. By the way, she let go of his hand and gave him an envelope. Bagheera was here earlier. He said he got this from some heavy set person with glasses. Malik asked about Baggy. He'd been recovering from a gunshot. He's fine, back in the street like nothing happened. That's good, I guess. He read the card. We heard your tape, son. Round the office, they calling it the perfect 10. Get at me. I've been searching all over for you ever since the barbecue. This guy's an A&AR for noise records. What does that mean? Artist and pimp relations. Oh, what does that mean? A vision came to mind of a blimp in a future time with bright red letters that read, the world is mine. I think it means they want to make me a deal. Brooklyn, February 92. The day after the party, Jerry gave his friend two gifts his very own copies of Lieber 7v7 and Hammer of the Gods. Here's my number, he said. Use it, ask questions, and remember. Creation, formation, actualization. Several months later, A.D. was still skeptical, but he couldn't deny the way Christie's reading had manifest, his reunion with Jess, his hooking up with Jerry, and the magic of their success. i has got to be something to this. He and Jerry had been at it for weeks, partying and getting wasted when he was reunited with a former love one night after running into an acquaintance at a club. Peter Parker, what's really good player? 10 minutes later, AD was caught in a web. Man, you always had the flow. And shit is different now, baby. Niggas ain't get. Ting jerk like that no more. They ought to come up. Man, niggas is closing six and seven figure deals. I can't do it, Pete. Fucking with that would fuck my money up. You know, I just touched down from a week in Grand Cayman, right? Rich nigga. Yeah said A.D. smiling. I had to make a few deposits at Castle. My man pops at the barbershop told me about Chew Man. He said you fucking with large cats in Atlanta, Denver, Miami, Vegas. Peter took a tape from a wannabe rapper. Pop's a fool. He said your passport got hella stamps on it. He said you done racked up more miles than some Kenyans in a marathon. A.D. laughed. You see this, don't you? Peter tossed the tape in a box behind the DJ booth. Everybody is trying to rap and they ain't got half of your skills. Ain't no nigga I know can put together metaphors better than you. A.D. was cheesing from ear to ear. Check it, a eh, a. Eh. You gotta think of rap money like hoe money, man. It may be slow, but it's show money. Too slow. What if I could get you on this tour I got coming up? Asked Peter. Just for a minute. You could test the water, 
get your beak wet. Think about it, man. You ain't local no more. You got to watch out for secret indictments and B, your face is too easy to trace. If nothing else, it'll be a good way for you to bleach that dough. He and AD slapped hands and backs. You always looking out for a nigga Pete. You just remember your boy when it's time for you to sign that deal. AD started opening for Smooth the next month, and though he'd never admit it, performing felt good to him. Deep down, there was only one thing he loved more than the stage. Brooklyn, March 94. In the Howard Beach area of Brooklyn was a condo, empty except for one room. In it was a stereo, 50 woe inch TV, a king-sized bed, and a box with nothing but condoms in it. This is the same place where the rhymes were invented. The furniture was gone now, relocated to an apartment in Clinton Hill. The walls, ceiling, and floors had all been redone in white, and yards of raw white linen hung from the ceiling, creating a supernal triangle around an altar of white candles. For the past 40 days, A.D. had spent the hours between midnight and noon here, invoking the spirit of Erda to assist him in cleansing the space as he create, formed, and actualized a dream that he and Diane both shared. It's a lovely place, that ain't it at all, Seth. How did you get it? One should never underestimate the power of denial. I'll be back soon. She remembered him saying that in 85, by 94, his underworld ties had become the subject of half of Brooklyn rapper's rhymes. A.D. sighed, come on, Ma, don't do this, not today. He'd paid some bills and given Diane gifts in the past, clothes, jewelry, and a used replacement for her old Buick but memories of past times wouldn't allow him to give her cash, even though she'd been clean for years. Everett was living in Queens with a divorced vet. She had two children when they married, and they had one girl together. He'd given up on his dream of becoming a barber and sold his soul. He was now a NYC letter carrier. His family could have survived on his salary, but a few years before he wed, he made the mistake of fathering twins with Fulani. Now the child support payments were kicking his ass. Shirley was a manager now. She was in a good relationship with the head of security at the store. She'd recently had her first child, a boy that A.D. treated like his own. Mallory, who lived two floors down from Diane, was in an abusive relationship and following in her mother's footsteps. A.D. had become the black sheep of the family, and Diane was hesitant to accept gifts from him, not wanting to be known as the mother of the drug dealer. Answer me then, Seth, and tell the truth for a change. All right, Ma, you got it. What do you want to know? Right, Seth, like you're really going to tell me. No, I'm serious, he said, wanting to get it over with. I'm tired of these arguments. I'm tired of the dirty looks I get out the corner of your eye. And I'm tired of people putting lies in your head. So cool. You want the truth, I'll give it to you. What do you want to know? What do I want to know? Diane's eyes narrowed as she moved in closer. Let me tell you something, Seth. I ain't one of your little know-nothing peons of the street. You ain't gonna stand there and play me out with none of your mind games. Can't nobody tell me shit about you. You're my child. As a matter of fact, she started poking him in the chest again and again. Let me tell you what I know. It was you who tried to kill my son. It was you who brought drugs into my home. Lie was you who keeps me jumping every time I hear the phone a ring. You planted that bloody knife in Josie's car, and you told the police where to find it. You are the reason Shirley got that abortion, um, and it was you who sacrificed that girl's life. Brooklyn, February 26th, 93. Death and jail had come to get paid landing the commission on their hardest times. Jersey was done, and just a week ago, some loose lips led to a bust and major losses in Virginia. 90 bricks to be exact, but with Jerry's help, A.D. was crawling back. A frustrated A.D. had been up all night and in the same clothes for days. It was just before noon when he hung up the phone for the umpteenth time, searching for anyone to make an emergency trip down south. He'd run through every number in his head, looking for a mule to carry two keys to Memphis. On the bed, all too aware of the situation and flipping through that month's, Vanity Fair was Jessica. It was Thanksgiving of 91 before she'd agreed to speak to him again. Another four or five months of visits, phone calls, 
and casual sex before he could win back his title. The only thing he really wanted. Word around campus was during their breakup, she had made a lot of new friends. A.D. couldn't see himself loosing to them, so he took his punishment, stuck it out through thick and thin until she'd made herself believe it. He loves me again. This time around, the feelings weren't the same. A part of him wanted to forgive, but that's not the part he listened to. I heard you was down there giving it away, he said. That's how you get back at a nigga, huh? Like that? Still, he set her up in his condo. For months, she tried everything in her power to get their relationship back to where it was before and to prove to him that her love endured. Can I go? She asked softly. And for what seemed like the thousandth time, know them down there. I'll go. This time, A.D. didn't ignore her or say no. Before the split, he would never have allowed her around this part of the game. But things were different now. She wasn't his no more. Who was she? She'd let friends come between them. How could he trust her? He looked at her sitting up now, her big doe eyes waiting for an answer, waiting for the chance to once again find grace in his eyes. She ain't innocent no mo. He looked at the makeshift belt packaged with coke and ready to go. Behind her, the television reported news that the World Trade Center had been bombed. Security at the airport would be tight. What else could go wrong? Unexplainable feelings in his gut seemed to answer his question. He put them out of his mind. He had to get Jerry's money. A.D. heard a voice that may or may not have been his. Fuck it. She know the risks. That's what he listened to. He picked up the belt. Jess, you follow these instructions and everything will be cool. Brooklyn, March 94. She must have really loved you for her to be doing 10 years. Don't chew have no shame. A.D. reached for her. I love you, Ma. If I did all that, I did it all for you. Diane snatched away from him and nearly screamed. Uh, uh, don't do that. I am not to blame for the things you've done, Seth. A.D. stared at his 55-year-old mother with the oily strands of gray in her braided hair and her arms folded not wanting to hear or talk. She looked like a weathered little girl. She reminded him of Shirley that day in the kitchen. Maybe somewhere deep inside him was that frightened little boy with the toy microphone. But what showed up today was light years away from the young man that either of them used to know. I admit I did some things I ain't proud of, he said. But I was young. I just wanted to live like the other kids. I had three pairs of pants, two shirts, and a pair of sneakers. That ain't living. What? You think I ilked selling to you? I thought I was making things better. I figured at least it's staying in the family. Diane never responded. She just looked at him. He moved toward her. She moved away. All right, I'm a bastard for that one. But damn, all my accomplishments, he asked solemnly. Hey, don't mean shit to you, do they? Ain't nothing I can do to get a kind word or a real hug from you, is it? She rolled her eyes and he shouted, fuck them. Every word was filled with vitriol. I did what had to be done for your family. I did the shit that you and all your deadbeat niggas couldn't do. I never sat around here getting high or feeling sorry for myself. I took care of us. A.D.'s face was grossly contorted when he screamed at the top of his lungs. Fuck them other people. Diane's hands were shaking as she walked slowly toward him. The pain in be throat as she tried to speak made her words slow to come. It's not your fault, Seth. You have a sickness something that's been eating at you for a long time, like a parasite eating a great big hole. My mother and your father, they have it too. It's like you're all dead, dead on the inside, but it's not your fault. She recited passages from Isaiah 14, 12, 21. The Lord can help you, Seth. He can save you. Look at me, she pleaded. Just look at what he did for me. By now, A.D. was calm again like nothing had ever happened. I remember sometimes you'd hold me close and motivate me. Tell me how I was the best. You'd say, anything in this world you want, you can possess. He smiled surely as he looked into Diane's eyes and shook his head. Now that I'm successful, you pull this shit. Who you fooling you knew I'd murder the whole world to prove him wrong and make you proud of me. Diane's face, at first just ghostly, turned a whiter shade of pale. 
Oddly, it wasn't his confession that frightened her. Gypsy was right, she thought, as she removed her hands from her face. Her eyes were puffy when she opened her arms to hug him. Seth, your faults as a son are due to mine as a mother. A.D. turned his back on her and walked away. I guess we both got to learn to live with regrets then. He dropped the keys on the floor. Happy birthday, Ma. And before she could yell, ah, he was out the door. Harlem, June 18th. Damn, this motherfucker is smooth and it handles nice in the curves. The eighth had taught A.D. that regrets were emotions and emotions were wasted energy. He continued admiring the brand new SC400 as he flossed it through traffic on the FDR and listened. Radio DJ. I would say the big news today is really yesterday's news. Former football great O.J. Simpson and his longtime buddy A.C. Cowlings, having both been taken into custody yesterday after leading numerous members of the California Police Department on a bizarre low-speed highway chase. O.J., of course, was set to burn himself in on charges that he murdered his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman. Mr. Cowlings was charged with aiding and abetting a fugitive. LARD sources say the two were tracked down by calls made from O.J.'s cellular phone. The buzz on his waist brought him back to full consciousness. He reached for the Nokia and pressed talk. The voice on the other end was deep and ghetto, but sexy still. We sup, player? Sup, ma? How you feel? He could care less. His thoughts were on their 7.30 reservations at a hot new restaurant, and it was now... What the fuck? The time surprised him. 6.43? If push came to shove, he'd have Jerry phone the hostess. But that upset him. All the money I spend in there and I still can't get it done myself? Respect. That's what was missing. No matter how much money he spent, he was still Jerry Friedman's friend. Mommy better not be trying to check me on the time. I'm good, Dada, said the voice. What's the deal? What you mean? I'm saying... Is we still on or pump your brakes, Ma? I'm like right there. Tim, cool data, but you know I'm with my girls and they about to ride out. Tell them freaks to pump y'all brakes. Them lames on that side of this town ant on shit. They can wait, she chuckled. This cat has got some nerve. He seized the second of silence before pressing the red button. Five minutes, Ma. I knew it. It was really 10 minutes or more, depending on how he drove, but after the call, he might make her wait. He really couldn't stand Brooklyn girls, but this one had skills. Still, the thought of her checking up on him. Not cool, he said, just above a whisper. Wind whipped his silken Versace short set around the car's interior. He caught a whiff of his dreamer cologne as he exited the freeway in Harlem. These motherfuckers, we remember the days of Rich Porter, Apple, and they the day Harlem belonged to- Shh! Don't ever mention those names. You will clash with mobsters. That's what Flam had once told him. Bro, this nigga, what the fuck am I fucking? Said ADR loud, before reviewing his list. Doors locked, check, stash box working, check he, elves and cheddar. Check. He turned the radio up and sang along with the hook. The world is mine. He had to admit, along with everyone else in 94, that's a hot line, but his light ain't shining. Lil homie ain't ready for war. It was 6.51, and the Seville Lounge was in sight when A.D. made the call. I'm here. Where you at? Be right there. He hit the hazards as she came out. He had to give it up. She was a thing of beauty. Cocky walk, tits firm, banging booty. He kept her wrapped tight in pastel Versace and fresh pedicures for her Joan and David pumps. He watched her as she moved to the driver's side of the coupe. Half black and Filipino, fringe benefit. She leaned in and greeted, sup pumpkin. What's up honey bunny? You got a new toy? Where's the GS? I'm freaking it ma, T, V's, Bama's that hot shit, since you gotta know. Poppy don't go there. You know Sassy has got her own biz to attend to, okay? I'm just playing my part, that's all. She gave him a quick kiss and wiped the $15 Mac print of his lips. One dollar for every year of her age. Supposed to, he whispered before brushing his hand over her ass. No panties and smelling like Issy. You play it well? He envisioned going in her raw for a moment. Whoa, he killed that thought. Hey, is we eating or what? We got a 7.30 in Manhattan. 
Sasi smiled a somewhat crooked smile. Let me go, so say bye to my people, Dada. Hurry up, man, you know I hate waiting. He watched her switch through the door. The Medusa's head on her ass had no momentarily turned him to stone before the bass from the small caravan of it pulling up cracked it and fred him. He smiled as the irony of the hook, the Lars car, was an $80,000 yellow Acura NSX, the driver's. Saturday car, he's okay, AD, said Fame. You can go in, we don't bite. Ford loved a baby, but these new Maury's is biting, hard. You chink at $350 a pair, they'd at least make them comfortable. Fame laughed loudly. Hit me, baby, we gon' politic. As usual, said AD. Next up, more irony. His security riding dirty in a pink J30. After that came a black Range Rover. The reggae beat banged from all three. What's up, playboy? A slow, friendly drawl came from the passenger side. Tommy the Titan. What the deal, playboy? Dizzy had changed Thomas' stage name for legal reasons. Your first disc, huh? Asked AD. Word, we threw mixing. It's gonna drop any minute. This is number 14, answered the Titan. I'm feeling it. Always knew you'd blow out like an afro. You right behind me, I'm a kick in the door for you, but my man Dizzy here deserves some credit too. The Titan put his arm around Dizzy. No foo okay in doubt, AD point to Dizzy. That's Harlem's hustler right there, and y'all too, yelled Dizzy as Brooklyn's finest. Yo, AD, we headed across the bridge to politic. You rolling? Nah. Tell Lil Mans I said one love, though. Aight. Dizzy turned up the track and peeled out in the 4.6. Damn, thought A.D., I'ma be a failure. If them clowns can make it. Saucy's perfume filled the Lexus as she plopped down and put her heels on the seat. See there, that's pride fucking wit chew. She said, brushing off his shoulder. You know you BK's finest, boo. If you don't get your heels off that, he passed her the chrome 380 he'd been gripping. He knew holding it kind of turned her on. He looked at the clock. 6.56, 8, infinity. He dialed the phone as they drove down Lenox Avenue. What up, Jerry? Hi, yo, do your mans a favor? Manhattan, June 18th, 6.51 p.m., excerpt 49. Come on, bro. I know you listen to Lenny, Jerry asked with amphetamine-fueled intensity. Romeo Blue? Man, he was screwing Denise. You remember that at least. Fortunate Devine was busy with his own epiphany. He'd done for his grandfather what his father wouldn't do, appear to the world as a productive member of society. He'd graduated Georgetown with a degree in economics. And when the summer was over, he'd begin a career with a respectable firm. Best of all, he was a member in good standing with Sigma P5 fraternity and the Prince Hall Lodge. Eleusis had learned from his mistakes with Diocese. In return, he tolerated Fortune's friends and their quest for fame, and he'd accepted Fortune as the heir to the divine family name. All that aside, Fortune was pleased to be home. He laughed at Jerry. They'd kept in touch mainly through the lodge and turned his gaze from the harbor as the two crossed the bridge into Manhattan. Whatever, asshole, you used to love her, said Jerry, tossing him the red pouch. Fortune opened it and found purple haze. Fuck no, he threw it back. You crazy? I ain't gonna see the brothers smelling like fucking Jimi Hendrix. And, uh, why you been holding out on me? Holding out on what? Holding out on that? It looks like amethyst that's so bright. Let me see it again. Jerry tossed it back. It smells like bubblegum, said Fortune. You had to bring this back with you? How much you got? About a half pound. My guy in customs couldn't let me through with more than that. But bro, I could get you that shit anytime you want. Why didn't you say something? Dude, it's June. The last time I talked to you was New Year's Eve, 
And the only thing I remember is canine playing in the background. You fucking up the lyrics and some chick moaning in French. Jerry grinned. Dude, you would have loved her. African with fucking green eyes, long brown hair, and ass like a zebra. Jerry exhaled. Her and her girls were dancers at the Moulin Rouge. Hey, let's call them. I got their numbers somewhere. Fortune chuckled and shook his head. That's why I ain't say something. You've been out of the country for what, like seven months? Yeah, it was lovely. I was getting head all over Europe. Jerry shuddered. They're so nasty, and they're bumping everybody's shit, fucking the Ennead, QMD, the boy. Man, Periscope Records is making a killing. That's my word. I don't know why you never go. You want to know why I never go? I'll tell you why. Because it's fucking cold there. My blood ain't mixed for that. I freeze my ass off here. I tell you what, next time I go to Rio or St. Thomas, you come and we'll kick it. It was 6.56 when Jerry tucked the sack and answered his phone. You got me, doing me, myself and I. That's some Jew boy shit if you didn't know. Anything's possible. No problem, man. It's done. 8.0 p.m. Is that cool? Good. Did my guys take care of you the other night? Good. When are you going back to the lab? You did? Outstanding. It's all good. It's going to be off the hook. Know it. A light. Tomorrow. One. Jerry phoned the restaurant, made the arrangements, and refocused his attention to Fortune. You don't go to the fucking meeting sober now, he asked disappointedly. Fortune answered carefully. Yeah. I mean, I've been really studying. I'm trying to be more than just advisor to the king. We ain't all born elite, you know. Like they say, membership has its privileged. Get the fuck out of here. And it's privileges, not privileged, fucker. They laughed again. One of them said, damn, bro, we got to kick it more often. Yeah, we do. The other replied, Fortunate, you ever heard of this guy from Brooklyn, A.D.? That lightweight kid from Marcy asked Fortune questioning Jerry's company. Yeah, but he's only light here in N.Y., He's got half of Virginia locked down, and in Jersey, his people boosted the murder rate so high, they sent the National Guard in to get him. Word? Asked Fortune, intrigued. Word. Come on, G. You're slipping. You should have been supplying these guys. As if you read my mind. Anyway, I was asking about him more so on the music tip. What, he's trying to do the label thing, too? Nah, nothing like that. I can barely get his ass in the studio. But... He's mad lyrical. I mean, his shit is good. You heard your man Dizzy's kid, the Titan. Yeah, I was talking to him the other day about that kid. He's got skills, but how is he going to market him? That's a risky move. Well, said Jerry, like a child with a secret, A.D. wrote a couple of those tracks. Really? Which ones? Jerry stopped at the intersection. He lowered the windows and turned the ALC off. Instantly, the scent of Freon and leather was replaced with heat and the smell of exhaust and cigarettes from hot pedestrians. He wanted the feel of Manhattan Island in June to engulf his prospect. He pressed the button on the console of the Porsche. Fortune listened to the disc and tried to become present. He smiled slightly and thought of his grandfather. He knew Jerry's tactic and wasn't at all offended by it. Why should he be? They'd learned it at the same place, in years of meetings like the one they were about to attend. If it had been him, he would have done the same, maybe with a bit more flair, but that was due to his time spent in the streets of Harlem. Manhattan and Harlem, so alike, yet so different. As above, so below. Jerry spoke swiftly with the precision of a skilled politician, something he'd learned from the company his family kept. Fortune was amazed by his brother, for another reason, though. No matter what drug of the moment, Jerry was on his skills as an orator, seemed to improve. Jerry gave him something else he'd brought back from Amsterdam. Open your mind, he said, passing him to Jagged Little Pill and explaining that track five was the song to beat. Fortune broke it in half and gave the rest Bichar track. What a pussy, Jerry said, laughing and washing the E down with Evian. He rolled the windows up and listened carefully to the last song on the disc as he pulled the Carrera into the parking area of the old Holland Lodge. One number here, two letters there. The license plates told the stories of vehicles from every country imaginable, informing the public that in a city where everyone was a star, these were the most dense. So what the verdict, Jerry asked? 
The lyrics are all right, but I'd like to see the whole package. Of course, I can set something up. Ooh. For who? For you. Why? Why not? What do I have to do with it? Bro, this guy is kind of ill. A partner would be a good thing. If it works out, this could be just what both of us need to get in good with the old men. You know how they feel about this music. Send your friend from uptown to feel him out. Let him play the man and we'll play the back. That was it. Fortune had been expecting something. He'd known Jerry for too long to take this ride as an act of pure generosity. He'd been disappointed if it were. Fortune figured it was time to make a move. The cycle needed changing. Vandals from the West had everything in chaos, and the mic deserved to be rocked by proper stock. It was hot money in the rap game, and he wanted all of it. Besides that, fame had been bugging him about managing a couple of bum as Renem P groups he'd put together. This could be what they needed to complete their dreams and the dreams of their fathers too, the Black Rockefellers. Don Deal, he said. I'll set it up and get back to you. I knew you would. I know his bag from the trunk. Believe me, man, this is going to work. You ready to see the brothers? Always. The next day at the barbershop, Fortune found fame already on top of things. Do this shit work? He grabbed Fortune's arm and shook it. I'm gonna get you a Rolex B, cause you late. I've been new about this cat. I was at the club about a month and a half ago. You know how Pete got his little side thing going. Pete who? Interrupted Fortune. Peter Parker. Spider-Man, he asked, only half joking. Muffu, the DJ. I'm telling you, you late B. All right. So I was dropping Pete a package and fucking around in the back of the club when I hear him on stage giving it to him. The crowd loved him. The nigga was on fire. I would have stayed and hollered that night, but I had money to make. Pete slid me a tape and hollered at him. A couple of days later, I went to see Dude and Marcy. NYMP, April 94. It was a clear, crisp day, but Fame decided to leave the Benz at home. He pulled up alone in a black tinted Pathfinder. Niggas put their dice away and put their ice grills on as he approached wearing jeans and a yellow North Face jacket to match his Tim's chain and bracelet. Three BK biddies sat lounging, whispering, and trying to start trouble. Y'all ain't shit. Y'all gonna let a Harlem nigga just soldier through here? Fame ignored them. He had other shit on his mind. Four, five, six, eight niggas. That's like four shells each. He kept a straight face when he spoke. Afternoon. How's everybody feeling? All eight niggas all turned into mimes. Where can I find A.D.? Who want to know? Tell him fame from uptown is here to politic with him. Our man Peter Parker already told him what about. Theo rest easy and motioned to Ta. He took his hand from under his coat and ran into the building as the other niggas started shooting again. Theo looked up from one knee. You riding through Marcy by yourself? Fame circled the toothpick around his mouth. Just me and the guns. The dude next to Theo muttered something. Theo laughed and said, They say your crew is thorough, the best out there. The others snickered. They right, said Fame, whoever they are. A.D. stepped out the building in jeans, brand new Air Force Ones, and a Dallas Cowboys parka with a matching cocked cap. He moved the rubber bands covering his long jeans. Famous game, he said. You early man. Fame wondered. Did this cat just call me by my government name? They traded pounds as A.D. looked around and asked, I thought you drove a platinum Benz. You creeping up on us? That's my Friday car, but I see you've been doing your homework. They laughed together. You hungry? Asked A.D. I know this low spot on Amsterdam. They got great lobster and we can talk there. Fame couldn't believe what he was hearing. You mean El Malacón? He asked. That's my hood man. You gonna pull my coat to a spot in my hood? Shit. You could have been allergic to shellfish. How I'm gonna know. Forty minutes later, A.D. was sitting through Fame's presentation for Prudential Records. He spoke at length about his vision for the label and what he hoped it would accomplish. How he wanted to get rich and bring jobs to people in his community and leave a legacy for his kids. How they'd pimp the music business, using it as a stepping stone before branching off into clothing, film, and anything else they could dream of. And you can get in on the ground floor of something greater than yourself, homeboy. I'm talking about starting a movement like they doing over at Major Federal. A.D. studied him. They were exact opposites in demeanor. 
I'm kind of quiet, but this cat can talk. He'd been yapping 15 minutes straight. Not about bullshit, though. More like he had something to prove. Maybe it's his height, but he really ain't short. He's average. Everything about him is average. Fame could come off that way, cantankerous, but he was smart and a product of good game. A.D. kept listening, and soon fame had him once again envisioning himself trench-coated and suited up in the L-shaped corner office of a Manhattan skyscraper. We not only hustlers, we businessmen, baby. And then he said, tie key words, I'm talking about multi-millions B, I mean running shit like the Rockefellers. That was it. Their avarice was the one place they stood completely eye to eye. A.D. figured having Jerry in one America and fame in the other would bring him the best of both worlds. Fame noticed his expression and bumped his knee against the table. B, you hearing me? Come on now. I talk fast because I think fast. Stay with me. A.D. was sold, but still cautious. He decided to let fame manage him for a while before he signed. Thank the bronze. July 3rd. It was just after 10 p.m., Sunday night, in a smoke-filled pool hall on 145 in the South Bronx. Fame had been waiting for the right time, and this was it. The rain had held off just long enough for the city to give its fireworks show. There the clouds burst just long enough to wet up the streets. Fame had one of his acts pitted against an up-and-coming group from Yonkers, three youngsters that loved to battle. They were managed by the Crazy 88s, another hustling crew from Harlem with a rep for being ride or die niggas. Fortune gave him their props. He couldn't stop talking about their lead act or the way he rolled, he don't give a fuck and he keeps his shit the hardest. According to him, the nigga was for real. Dog is a fucking problem, explained Fortune. No disrespect man, but you better bring your whole crew. Fame called up AD as insurance. When he walked in, the leader of the 885 called his man who was out of state putting in work. Yo, dog, I need you to drop everything and get up here now. Loyal to the core, he immediately hitched a cab from Baltimore. Inside the club, two pool tables served as the dividing line. Prudential on one side and the crazy 88s on the other. The cruise got it started and just after one, a swarthy figure entered and quietly took his place. It was the 4th of July, and everyone was on edge waiting for the big guns to pop off. The youngsters ran out of ammo and the crowd began chanting, let them loose, baby. They about to spark. A.D. stood on one table and the mysterious figure climbed on the other. The whole club circled them watching for almost an hour as the two locked jaws and ripped plugs out of each other. It was close to 3 a.m., closing. The club was still rowdy and still too close to call. The crazy 88's man point to A.D. and went first. The battle for New York had come down to this last verse. Peep this, right there in disguise is a cat. He sniffed and looked over at fame. Smell that right there, in your crew is a rat. It'll be like 2004 when you remember this verse, when you're wondering how in the hell for 10 years did that nigga hide his skirt. When the smoke cleared, A.D. smiled and point back. This cat here will put you back in the dirt from which you came. Homie, you reek of pain. Walk back to be more. Let it wash off in the rain. In 10 years, this game will still belong to me, fortune and fame. And you'll be all smoked out and niggas still won't know your name. Manhattan, Lee Meridian, July 4th. It was early afternoon when Jerry called and said he'd be there soon. Fame showed the girls to the door and called for service to the room before asking fortune. So what did you see? I see a new day, fame. A bright sunlit day. Fortune focused on his vision in the carafe of Pellegrino. This morning, I seen a dynasty dawning. Prudential Records is gonna hold that blue flame for the next thousand years. Fame's vision was more exoteric. I see that too. Only in my vision, the flame is green from all the paper we gonna burn. Life is ridiculous. Who would have thought a cat from Brooklyn was gonna make some Harlem niggas rich? My fault, richer. I'm a hustle CDs like I hustle these packs, B. Fame, in 10 years, Prudential will be the biggest thing out there, and this family will be 100% legit thanks to your boy. All we have to do is work out a few kinks. Like what? Nothing serious, just a couple of industry niggas. Like who? Fame's voice was high, and he was looking at Fortune like he'd lost his mind. 
B, fuck a fake ass rapper. I'll make him famous. He cocked his Glock. You're nobody till somebody kills you. I with you, but it ain't just him. We got those fools out west to deal with too. You down with that? His looked into his brother's eyes and wondered if they were on the same page. Before college, they'd been equals, but the instant fame locked eyes with fortune, he knew he was being judged. And this was not a question of which car to buy or where do I choose to call home? No, this is the question that answers those and more. It's for questions like these that you rely on the pension processor in your head and hope that its bites of RAM and gigs are enough. Quick, do you trust your intel and make a move or do you wait for another vista of opportunity or perhaps this instant of hesitation has already sealed your fate? Questions like these test the metal of men. At times like these, they look through the hole in another's head and see straight into their soul. Fortune tilted his head slightly. And though it seemed like forever, only a few seconds would pass before fame cleared his thoughts and did the same. B, whoever. My brother, Fortune said, relieved. Our choices define who we are. The moment we stop thinking ahead is the beginning of our end. So nothing can stand in the way of our progress. We must always rise above. Fortuné poured his father's favorite cognac into fame's empty glass and made a toast. To prudential records, the glasses clinked. As they sipped, Fortune remembered a story his father had told him as they drove home from his mother's funeral. Deoses explained to him how, on a cold night in a bar in Queens, he'd put his life into the hands of another man. That man asked me to believe in a dream that would change my life, a dream that would integrate our lives and make our families as rich and powerful as the Rockefellers or the Kennedys. Diosis smiled at the recollection. When I was growing up, people wanted to know about John D. so bad the papers reported his every move. I don't think we got that far, but my decision that night was one of the best I've ever made. I was at a crossroad in my life. I didn't like the path I was on, and I wasn't sure of the one I'd been asked to take. But Napalm and Agent Orange had proven to me what evil men will do, and I wasn't afraid no more. I went into the jungle with honor, and more importantly, I came back with it. I called the man with me that night, brother, because he'd done the same. I trusted him. So that night in the bar when he asked that I see his dream, I tried. Did you? Fortune recalled asking his father. That's irrelevant, son. Brothers do what must be done. 23 years later, each man was standing in his father's shoes, but the roles had been reversed. Fortunate realized this was what they called noblesse oblige. It was their turn to push forward the dreams of their fathers. He put his glass down and placed both hands together. With all five fingers touching at their tips, he opened them until only his thumbs and pointers were touching. Then he peeked through the opening with one eye and said, fam, before he could finish, there was a knock at the door. Fortune opened it. What did I miss? Jerry asked excitedly. Everything, answered Fortune. That sucks. I was out of it anyway. Tell us something new, said Fame sarcastically. Jerry paid him no mind. He grabbed some grapes and nibbled off the vine. Well, Fame, it's on you. What do you think? When I think of Brooklyn, I think of Jordans and gold chains, niggas driving broke, vigors, and living with they moms. My man is different. I like him, Jerry asked Fortune. What about you, bro? Fortune toyed with his pinky ring. Well, he's definitely a hustler. Whatever he can do to make money, he'll do it. And the flow most incredible, Fame shouted. I told you, said Jerry with his mouth full. Yet there was tension in the room. Everyone seemed to be holding something back. Finally, Jerry said matter-of-factly, I don't trust him. He may be too smart. Me either, admitted Fortune. They looked at fame. His mouth was full of fermented grapes when he shook his head and mumbled, Uh, uh, good, said Jerry. For once, we all agree. We'll find a way to test his loyalty. It was time to check out. They gathered their things. In the hotel lobby, let phone rang. He took a look at the number and stepped away. I'm going to the bathroom, said Fame. 
Inside, he recognized a voice coming from the stall. What do you mean? Where have I been? I've been dialing your number for 15 minutes. It's been going straight to your voicemail. I was just about to leave. Yeah, Mon, I've got it. Okay, meet me in the suite. Five minutes, Mon. Fame was stunned when the stall door opened. Trenny Mon, what the deal? Where you been hiding yourself? Trenny was not amused. First of all, Fame did a bad Jamaican accent, and second, Trenny was Haitian, early 30s, 5'7", light-skinned with a receding hairline, and a rep for high-end fashion labels and kinky sex. It was guys like him that coined the term metrosexual after years of being called gay. Even worse was his reputation for leaking information to escape the wrath of a DA. His latest case had been all over the news. Trenny frowned. He looked around the restroom and gave Fame a pound. Hiding? Trenny don't hide from nothing, mon. What you up to these days, Famous? Still trying to play with the big boys. Fame forced a little laughter. Be the shit. Keep your eyes open, Trenny. Me and Fortune just signed a new act. He's gone. Trenny laughed at his optimism, fixed his clothes, and moved toward the door. How is Fortune? I haven't seen you two together in a long time. I'm sure prized he lets you drag him into your craziness. The water shut off and Fame went to dry his hands. Ask him yourself. Him and his man Jerry are in the lobby checking out. Trenny gave Fame a look he couldn't quite place. Jerry, he stopped himself and forced his own laughter. Another time I see you guys around. I got some business to do. Trenny hurried out the door. That nigga's acting shadier than usual, thought Fame. Around the corner, he found Fortune on the phone. Yo, guess who I just... Fame stopped talking when Fortune put his finger to his lips and whispered, This is Honey. I met the other night at Nell's. Fame searched the lobby, then mouthed the words, Yo, where's Jerry? Fortune put his hand over the phone and whispered, He got a call. He said he'll hook up with us later. Fortune hung up the phone as they made their way to the valet. And not a minute too soon, Fame had to get something off his chest. I'ma keep it real with Chew Man. I never liked dude and you know it. I give him credit. He's a hell of a businessman. But he trains people to kiss ass. And I ain't with that. Jerry doesn't give a fuck about you or me or anyone else. You can't trust him. His only loyalties are to the dough and his family. That's it. That's all. Fortunate had been preparing for this moment for 12 years. He would decided to give fame the simplest answer he could. That's the thing, Fame. You're my brother, and so is he. We're all family now. Atlantic City, August 6th, 94. Thomas hadn't seen his family, his dough, the crap tables, or anything else for that matter. Since they'd met, he'd only had eyes for her. He'd come from under her spell long enough to make a call. Nigga, where the fuck is you? Asked the boy. I've been calling you, paging you. What you been on? Thomas laughed. Shit's been crazy, man. I threw that pager away. I'ma give you the new number. Hold on. Somebody want to speak to you. Her voice was laid back and sultry like she'd been steaming for days. Hey, what's up? I can't believe I'm talking to you. The boy wondered how she looked. Ricardo told me all about you, she said. He says you mad cool. We gotta get together sometime and kick it. She gave the phone back to Thomas. Who was that? Asked the boy. And who the fuck is Ricardo? Ricardo is my pet name, and that was Hope, my wife. The boy was shocked at first, but it all added up when he thought about it. He and Thomas had become inseparable. Like twins separated at birth and later reunited, they were a modern day Castor and Pollux who'd had cookouts together, rocked the mic, hit clubs and laid groupies together. When Thomas and his crew came to some club dates in Los Angeles, the boy witnessed firsthand how long it took for him to fall in love. Dizzy ain't paying for the whore? Man, fuck that bitch. Y'all can crash a my crib. And when the female the boy was seeing at the time protested, man, fuck that bitch. The bedrooms is full, but the couch is yours as long you need it. The boy even had dates lined up for them. Thomas's was nice and thick. Good looking dog. She remind me of that chick from Escape, but her conversation ain't all that. Yet the morning after, he was ready to give her the safe combination and all that. The boy overheard him macking as the two sipped Mo and played Nintendo on his living room floor. Boo, just picture life as my wife. He couldn't blame Thomas too much. He was like family and all, but the truth was the truth. 
He couldn't have gotten much pussy. Even he described himself as black and ugly and Dizzy said he looked like he could rob a liquor store without a gun. Your wife, when you get married, asked the boy, like two days ago, how you meet her. We were shooting a video and Dizzy introduced us. How long you known her? Almost two weeks. Nigga, is you crazy? You fitting to be paid? How you know she ain't after your hundred? You sound like mom Duke. Nigga, what loot? Don't I owe you a couple? Man, fuck that. Look, T, I'm gonna give you some game I got from an OGR in Oakland. The world is filled with pimps and hoes, and you can't turn one into a housewife. Crazy ass man, doe. Nah, I trust honey, she ain't like that. Plus she's a singer, she got her own. He explained how though she hadn't asked for it, he'd bought her designer clothes and a full length mink, a gold necklace and bracelet with X and a bow links. Dig it, whispered Thomas. After I hit that she starts telling me how compared to me, no other love could measure. Now she got my name tattooed on her titty. Thomas told some more jokes to lighten the mood. Soon they were both laughing. Fuck it, thought the boy. He's a grown ass man. Plus his call had been right on time. The boy needed something to get his mind off his problems. The last 14 months had been wrought with ups and downs. His first two discs were big hits on the underground but had yet to go gold. He'd received critical acclaim for his roles in two motion pictures, but had also been publicly fired from the sets of two more. He'd celebrated beating charges by pimp walking out of federal court, but he'd done time on a petty case. Now the trial date had been set for his most serious legal bout yet. Charges that had come from a most unexpected place, New York City in Dock Club, late 1993. The boy was 22, a man but a flawed one, handsome but years of hard living, had him frayed around the edges. He was going places he couldn't enter with team parkas, phalas, and 10 karat gold herringbones. From some directions came whispers and from others, the shouts of family members, strangers, and famous well-wishers with belated advice on how to stay out of trouble and make his way in the world. You're hanging with the wrong crowd. You don't belong with them anymore. You're a star. You need to find a new group of friends if you plan to make it in this business. He wondered where they'd been all these years as he pondered these social conundrums. How does a loner make friends? And to whom can you turn when society has labeled you a troublemaker? Historically, this is the time when a man turns to a good woman, but there lay another dilemma. Where do you find one of those when every parent in your new tax bracket had already threatened their daughters? If you bring him home, well, cut you loose. And their sons weren't much better. Trust fund babies wary of the nouveau riche outsider. So where do we turn, we creatures of habit, continuously positioning ourselves in the places we feel most safe? Usually that means amongst our own kind and for the boy that meant the have-nots, the bohemians, and the outlaws. His advisors had yet to warn him that was next to impossible. He was a mark now that he had dough. It came as little surprise when back in June, Trenny called. He and Roberto were busy reinventing themselves as what else? Hustlers turned record execs. Every city had a few, all stuck in the same predicament, caught between the world they'd done everything to escape and a new one that was reluctant to let them in. This month, the boy decided to move to New York while he filmed his latest movie there. Trenny and his man Glover met him on the set and promised to show him around and keep him out of trouble. All they asked from him is that he thought about doing a verse with a couple of their artists just to help them get on. For that they'd promised to pay him well and had even put their people at his beck and call, driving him around town and taking him shopping on Fifth Avenue. They introduced him to Jacob the jeweler where he spent nearly $60,000. There they bought him a gift, a rite of passage for East Coast hustlers, his very own Rolex with a diamond bezel. Now that he'd been laced and fit the part, they promised to introduce him to a better class of female than he'd been known to deal with. Each night from sundown to sunup, they made the rounds. On this particular night, a Friday in mid-November, they landed at Jezebel's. The club was classy. It was the flip side of anything the boy had seen at the tunnel or his other haunts. At last, he was around people he looked up to, people with as much money and status as him. It wasn't long before one after another pro athletes, celebrities, and beautiful women began fawning over him. We all think you so fly. Leather skirt. Elated, he was on the floor dancing when he spot her. A video vixen in a short, 
excerpt 50. Start like a jackrabbit, finish in front, solve it. On the night is Jack, that's it, understand. I'm the daddy at the Mac, daddy. There's a left and go, leave me. Ain't no home, we gonna pay me. Tops of left, bricks and lies. I'm the Liverpool gangster. He couldn't see her face. Chronic and Tangare had him high. She danced up to him ass first. His judgment awry, he spanked it and accepted her offering. Sue turned around and the scent of Bijan was forced through her sheer top by ample breasts. He looked down. Damn girl, you got some, uh, what thighs on you? She licked her lips. The music in the club banged. His head throbbed. She grabbed it and led him to a dim corner. 10 minutes later, he found Glover at the bar. Man, I need you to run me and old girl back to the hotel real quick. Glover looked at her standing in the crowd with tousled hair and smeared lipstick. She looked anxious to get somewhere private and finish what she'd started. A couple of hours later, Trenny, Glover, and J.I. stumbled drunk and rowdy into the boy's suite. J.I. crashed down on the other bed, waking him up when he asked, where that hoe at man, she had fat ass. She looks like that freaky bitch. What's her name? Glover snapped his fingers. Lisa Nicole Carson. You fucked her in the club, didn't you? Trenny was a bit overzealous, wanting intimate details, as he flicked some powder from his swollen nose. How'd vu fuck her, mon, huh? How you do it? Even Glover took a step back. The boy just wanted to get back to sleep and played it off. Put it like this, he said. We was in there having sex. We weren't in there making love. A day later, under orders from officials at City Hall, an army of nearly 200 lawmen, SWAT teams, tactical units, and reporters invaded the Swank Manhattan Hotel. On the ground floor, the elevator door opened and cameras blinded him as he stepped off. The paparazzi and hotel employees were all shouting and pointing as he walked shackled and embarrassed through the lobby. A lone policeman seemed genuinely concerned with the boy's welfare and asked, what the hell you done now? To which he replied, I ain't did shit, officer, that bitch tripping. On another front, the so-called war on gangster rap was on strong. As major shareholders of Periscope Records, Clockwork Enterprises was stuck between a rock and pressure from its friends in high places. Indeed, Periscope CEOs had their hands full. K9 was facing murder charges, QMD was on house arrest, and the entire firing squad roster seemed to be headed for prison. Dozens of right-wing conservative groups and bold opportunists seeking financial gain, had band together to attack the music. How would Periscope ever sign new artists if they gave in to pressures from their parent company or anyone else in corporate America? Guns and beat downs were a part of an image. They could put the spin on those. The boy's new case, however, that was something different. Periscope stuck by him longer than most, but after a meeting with the CEOs, the boy got the feeling they'd tired of his litigiousness and had washed their hands of him. Meanwhile, with attorney fees piling up and his funds low, the boy became a voice for hire communicating constantly through his pager, a musical mercenary for money spitting rhymes instead of bullets and hustling verses instead of weight. That's when he began to notice that all around him the faces looked the same, and somehow the rap game had begun to remind him of the crack game. Manhattan, La Meridian, November 94. Jerry entered the hotel with instructions on a special job for a special friend. His friend left their meeting and went directly to another where he gave his own instructions. It's all set, just put him in check. But if he get live, fuck it. Y'all put his ass in dead nigger storage. Manhattan, Gethsemane Studios, days later. Beep, beep, beep. The boy's sky pager went off again. His manager asked if he wanted the phone. Nah, fuck him. We here now. Roberto had been calling all night trying to get the boy in the studio to do a song. First he had the money, then he didn't. The last time they talked, he'd managed to put together 6,000, and someone they both knew was there to put up the other four. Long as the 10 grand is there, I'm on my way, he'd said. But the vibe wasn't right. He'd been introduced to Tranny and Glover through Roberto, and early on in the trial, his co-defendants had retained different counsel and hadn't spoken to him in months. Since then, he'd received a number of veiled threats from friends of theirs, 
but the boy kept his mind on the money. 10 grand, 10 grand. Yo, J.I., yo, bitch full. Yeah, dog, she's straight. J.I. fingered her as they walked down the block. I got that bitch right here. The boy's girlfriend was on a new diet, nothing but hollow shells. He'd stuffed her full of those before leaving the hotel. The clock in Times Square read 1217. When J.I. threw the down the last of the blunt, just then they all heard a voice from above. We got a gang of that shit in here. They looked up and saw Julius on a balcony. J.I. yelled, sup my nigga, everybody here? You know it, Julius yelled back. J.I. turned to the boy. Well, that says it. Dizzy and the fam up there, we straight. The weed had calmed the boy down some. He hadn't kicked it with Thomas in months. He smiled at the thought of he and the Titan getting lifted and bugging out. With the end of his trial just hours away, he'd acquiesced his life to good hands. Only God can judge me now. In a remote location, a Japanese luxury car idled. Its driver sat watching the lobby through a telescopic camera lens. When the group entered, a man dressed from head to toe in fatigues stepped out and extended two fingers from a black gloved hand. 30 seconds later, five flashes lit the lobby of the building and the car blended easily into traffic. Manhattan, municipal court building, the next day. Sir, said the judge, you understand that you've been found guilty on the charge set before you. Then he addressed the boy's attorney. Counsel, in light of these recent circumstances and your client's physical condition, I will reinstate bail, giving him a period to convalesce before his sentencing. That date is set for 